Oh, where hello. Okie dokie. So, what are we talking about here? We're talking about Slavoj Žižek, and we're talking about this weird ass. Um, what, do you, what do you call him? Uh, what did I call it? Political theology. So political theology is this weird sort of little subtopic under political philosophy, which has a few little assumptions to it. And so the philosophers that will fall under it will be, you know, Nietzsche, Carl Schmitt, um, Joseph de Mestre, um, you'll get, I mean, there, there are people who sort of played with the ideas that are underneath it, like uh, Maximilian Robespierre from, you know, the uh, French revolutionary. Um, and Zizek sort of talks about these, these topics a lot. And the general idea behind political theology is that the same structures which guide religion guide politics. So underneath and that politics is uh, politics and religion are part of the same sort of human behavior stuff. So, your the way that you engage in politics is a result from Adrian v Vivier. Adrian Vivier. Okay, hello. Um, so, um, where the hell was I? My brain's skipping around. Oh yes. So the general idea is that what structures human human society is a series of beliefs that we don't really uh, we don't really interrogate we don't really think about too deeply um and their belief uh anti marxist said <laughs> elbow cough elbow cough is a fantastic one actually because okay sure it's sensible and i think we should all do it but it's interesting how it appears as a behavior only now that we've got this coronavirus thing going on. So we've got this thing, the, the, this bit of behavior that we can associate with a sort of a very big social structure. And re religion is, so religion really is a modern thing. I mean, you know, before you've got really big hierarchical societies, um, spiritual beliefs don't have ingrained structures to them. They reflect the sort of unmoored nomadic life of the, the, the you know people who have who who, who live in, in pre-settled societies. But once you've got sort of a settled society, hierarchy big hierarchies emerge and the human mind, the human imagination reaches towards profound things in a hierarchical fashion. And the way that you got to look at it, this uh, the way you got to look at all of these big ideas is that um, is that at its bot, uh, whether you're talking about the, when you when you ask people what their moral foundation is, it's never something rational. Because I have a Marxist downstairs now; he's got something else to cook my curry that I bought. Can't complain now, at least we're not cooking for a change. Okay, well, look, you know, um, sometimes Marxists have to work and do things too instead of sitting on their asses. But um, uh, I, I will get to your question. I should probably ignore the chat for a minute so I can actually focus. But basically my point is that um, religion gives people um, a sort of structure of assumed dogmatic positions that are not always purely um, rational. In fact, they're, they're, they function better if they're not rational. Um, just dogma. And what they do is they give people a foundation against which to check all of the other beliefs that they're allowed to have in society. And so politics is checked against this sort of substrate of religious or met or, or what pretentious people will call um, metaphor. or well, I say pretentious people. Philosophers have a technical use of the term metaphysics, but um, let's just say it's metaphysical or religious. So you have this like you have like a basis for society's morality and everything. And the three questions that I always ask when you're looking at any philosophy, and it can strip everything down to the core, is what, what, uh, when you look at their argument, what does their argument say? They say, well, what exists, like what's real, what's out there, what ought we to do or not to do? That's morality and ethics and so on. And then who gets to decide things? So that's authority. So it's ontology. Ontology is an awfully sort of niche word, but it has a technical meaning that's quite useful. So ontology, morality, and authority. That's what you need to look at. The thing is that um, 
relig- the, the way that we think in society and religion structures all of these things. So let's say that you're a Christian. You know, what exists in the world is is something is this material realm that overlaps with um, a spiritual realm, and both of these realms flow from the creation of God. And God has given us His only begotten Son um, as an aspect of Himself, depending which you know uh, denominations theology you believe, um, and the 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 this this incarnation redeems mankind and brings them into um the uh, into everlasting life and from the teachings of Jesus Christ um and reflections on the the inspired divinely inspired stories in the bible we come to an understanding of morality and society and all political ideas and how we ought to manage our life have to flow from this sort of strange symbolic realm full of really deep and um, pre-rational ideas. And um, Zizek is a big fan of this guy called Lacan. And Lacan has, uh, I'm going to leave most of Lacan out here because he's a very weird guy with a lot of very big weird ideas. But there's a, there's one thing that you need to, to sort of bear in mind is that he has... He has this idea that you have, he talks about the, imag- it, it, just use these words very carefully because he use, it means them in a technical sense because they're sort of half translated from French and the concepts in French don't really overlap with the English ones. So he talks about imagination and what he means by imagination is the way that your mind apprehends things before you cast it into language. Um, and so there's a sort of spontaneous element to the human mind um, that that he calls the the imagination, and then there's the symbolic, and the symbolic refers to language and symbols and all that kind of stuff that we use to capture the world. And then there's the real, which is some objective thing out there that is shared by all commonly experiencing people in the world. And so the 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 thing about, you know, when you're talking about religion is then it gets kind of mysterious because you're using, clearly on some level, there's something symbolic going on. And clearly on some level, there's something non-symbolic going on because the symbolic realm functions according to logic and reason. But we don't experience religion as logic and reason. We experience a lot of our understanding of it spontaneously and check our reasoning against this sort of um, background of assumptions. And when you look at people who practice theology, what they'll do is they'll sit and um, they'll sit and make sure that all of the reasoning about how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to structure society, what's true, what's false, what's real, um, it's always checked uh, in a consistent fashion uh, for internal consistency and then also against um, this non-rational sort of background um, of uh, very, very obscure and profound and ineffable non-rational symbols and beliefs. So another weird way to think about this, and I think that this is kind of important, is when you if you're if you're talking to a child, and the child says to you, okay, why is this like this? And then you give them an answer. Oh, why is the sky blue? I mean, there's a great Louis C.K. little sketch on this thing where he talks about his kid doing this. And the obvious problem, if you keep going back with why, is that you get to the point where you have nothing to hold on to. You know, they'll they'll the, the, the kid will ask why in response to something as basic as some things exist and some things don't. And I mean, it's it, it's it's quite silly, but th- there's and for the same reason that you have the, the same thing is encountered not just with like descriptive stuff, you know, what is what exists, ontological things. It's also encountered with morality. So you ask, well, why should I eat my greens? Because I say so. If you sit with your five-year-old kid and try and explain them sort of like advanced um, nutrition, they're just going to turn their nose up or ask why again. And this is. This is called skepticism. 
what they're doing with all of these whys. This is a skeptical position, right? And you can apply skepticism however you want. And the thing about, so the modern world, the first moment that you start to see all of this Christianity fall apart is when you get um, when you get to the Renaissance. And the big philosophy, if you study a philosophy course at any university, one of the first guys that you're introduced to is Descartes. And Descartes says, well, I want my philosophy to be founded on absolute certainty, right? This absolutely rigid certainty. So I'm going to poke at anything that I can doubt and see what's left over. So he realizes you can come up with an excuse to doubt everything, including the external world. You're hallucinating. It's the matrix, you know, whatever. And so you get down to the only thing he says you can't doubt is that you're experiencing the world. And then in order to not get persecuted by, you know, religious authorities or whatever, he says, well, you also can't, count, you know, doubt God. But, of course, he still gets persecuted and he runs away to the Netherlands, like all people, all, all intellectuals who don't fit in, sort of do end up in the Netherlands. So um, he, but, but the problem with this is that he, he then thinks that you can use abstract reason to climb out of this hole and get to certain knowledge about the world. Now, ah, he's not working, Rob. He delegated the job. Well, of course he did. He's, what do Marxists do when they get into power? They find some peasant to do their work for them while they push papers around in the in the Politburo. Anyway, um, what the fuck was I saying? Oh yeah, so there's this weird uh, there's this weird idea called Gnosticism. So like Gnosticism, um, it's been around since the very earliest days of Christianity, and uh, there's a lot to get into here, um, but eventually I want to drag your attention to a fellow called Eric Vogler, and I will be doing, I'll just pick a little reading from him a bit later. But first I want to read about Slavoj Žižek, who's, he's a big ass. Um, so I want you to bear in mind Descartes when I get back to, um, when I get back to uh, uh, Eric Vogler. The thing about Descartes and all of this doubt shit is as um, as Nietzsche says, once you start doubting God and you pull that pin, it's like pulling the bottom uh, pin out of a Jenga tower. Everything falls over because there there is always some highest belief that if you start doubting it, it disintegrates the whole religious structure, the whole thing that holds society together. And you can do this with almost any belief system. Um, and once you, once you look at something like postmodernism, what postmodernism does is it applies this radical doubt to not just like religion or whatever, but to all concepts, right? But then it does it only selectively. So it does it, 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 it the, 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 the postmodern tradition, which is now being adopted a little bit by the right, which is, um, which has its upsides and downsides. Postmodern tradition for most of the mid to late twentieth century, what they focused on was applying radical doubt to any concept that structures society and allows people to understand their social universe. So the nation, religion, um, private property, all of this kind of stuff, radically subjected to doubt. Um, and you know, you, you instead of seeing how these give. Uh, a structure to society that allows people to have a, a natural uh, communication together, they, they, they paint it as this uh, sort of cynical mechanism of control, which is a, it's an idea that they get from Karl Marx. And I'm actually, before I read this, I'm going to actually share a little excerpt from, because um, I think it's one of the best uh, layman's, uh, one of the best layman's uh, uh, explanations of kind of what I'm talking about. Um, and, oh, do come on. Here we go. So it's, it's um, you know, uh, Peter Bogosian, James Lindsay, and Helen Pluckrose. And so they discuss intersectionality and ask it. To, I, I think they're wrong, and I'll tell you what I, what I have. Well, I think they're right about a lot of things, but I think they're wrong about some things, and I'll explain it in a minute. So um, just give me a second. I'll just play this for you. If my computer will wake up. Come on, boy. Come on. 
Come on. Give us what is what is religion? It's a, it's a disambiguate that it's a yeah. tricky term. It's a, yeah, religions actually. So to give you guys some background on why I would tell you what a religion is, uh, I've spent several years studying religious psychology and moral psychology with with kind of a keen research interest, and so I'm coming at it from those perspectives. Uh, religion is a very difficult construct to define, and in fact, people who study the psychology of religion from an empirical standpoint almost refuse to do so. They will say that uh, any definition of religion that says, oh, a religion is just, and then fill in the blank with it could be a very long chapter, long book length explanation, probably is going to miss something from some religions up, excuse me, somewhere. So it's very difficult to, to define a religion. That said, religions are studied empirically in, in terms of a number of different traits that they exhibit. They tend to be meaning-making structures, but at the very bottom, the way that they act as meaning-making structures are as communities. In fact, there are communities organized around certain moral principles that are often derived from scripture or doctrine. So you have scriptural or doctrinal, um, actually, I'll give a second. No, you're good, you're good. You have scriptural, scriptural or doctrinal, uh, definitions of what, what moral structure there is. These are used in order to define, shape, and enforce the boundaries of a community. These communities are called moral communities in general, and religions equip them with a dogma, a dogma or a doctrine or a scripture that gives them an inherent ideology. Usually religions have a feature that they describe that in a mythological or poetic way. A lot of times it's deities, gods, uh, it doesn't have to be. Buddhism doesn't necessarily have gods. It can be practiced religiously without gods. Sometimes the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and so on are are deified or reified. Or they're raised up to a kind of god or demigod type status. Not always. Same with religious Taoism. So it doesn't have to rely on gods. It just needs a mythological structure that distinguishes it from other ideological <laughs> mechanisms like, say, political parties, which are also often moral communities that enforce their boundaries and so on. They have specific features. They tend to focus on moral purity for the in-group. They tend to demonize the out-group. They especially demonize heretics or blasphemers or uh, anybody who, who goes too far outside of the, the, that dogmatic often structure of belief that threatens it. Those people are often excommunicated. So these kinds of structures are very prominent within religions. These Communities exist. They didn't come out of a vacuum, or if you maybe believe that they were handed down from God as, as a liberal atheist, I don't. Uh, they, they evolved alongside human cultures in order to solve certain social and psychological problems that people all have. We have needs, we need order, we need structure in society. We need to understand our place in the community and how we fit into the community, how to relate to one another. Uh, we need to have a sense that there is control over the universe, that, that in where I come from in the southeast, that Jesus can take the wheel. And I say that because it was just in the news that somebody tried that in my state of Tennessee recently, and it didn't work out good. Um, <laughs> it crashed. It crashed, it crashed yeah. <laughs> went right off the road. Um, it was oh, shame. Jesus take the wheel and went right off the highway. Oh, no. It doesn't matter about so um, that's like a sense that the universe has control. Things won't get too bad. Uh, you know, God bless America is sort of a slogan that speaks to that. Uh, or in God we trust is another slogan. It's on the wall at my post office, which I don't know if that's like a violation or not, but it is because I'm in the South. Um, it's also a national motto, so here we are. Uh, they also look for control in an active sense. Intercessory prayer, for example. Be able to, to pray on behalf that, you know, let my child not be sick anymore. Please don't let my child die. That's an, an, a, it's an action taken in order to gain a sense of control over uncontrollable circumstances. So we have deep-seated human needs for making meaning out of things, for having control, for finding self-control also. These are okay things. We also have deep-seated human needs for having a community that we can contextualize ourselves in and understand who we are and come together and be social. So these deep-seated psychosocial needs, as it's called, are the underlying purpose from a psychological perspective of why human beings 
are religious. Okay, can I just so if you were to just bullet point those, so control. Control, meaning making, community. Meaning making, community, okay. So some of the intersections, let's talk about how intersectionality, what, what features do they share in common? I don't know, who wants to go first? Well, with, um, as, as with a lot of ideologies, we have very much the in-group and the out-group. We have the, the very strong belief with a strong moral element that you are either with us or you're against us. And in James's book, um, Everybody is Wrong About God, he drew uh, a few psychologists to show that people associate with God all, all that is good. And so if, if when atheists will say that they don't believe in God, they're very often understood to say, I don't believe in good. I, I, I'm against anything that's good. And this is also very commonly seen in social justice movements where to say, I don't like this approach to equality is not to say, well, I prefer a universal liberal or I am a conservative with a libertarian bent who wants everybody to have the same opportunities. It's essentially to say, I am a Nazi. So that's... Um, yeah. So that's, that's one. That's what, what, would be, what would be another example? So yeah. another huge thing that, that, that religions tend to do is that they tend to create what I've referred to in a couple of things I've written before is, is an island epistemology. They they come up with their own means of producing knowledge that from the outside becomes unfalsifiable or indefeasible. So, for example... Okay, that's, that's enough of that for now. Um, so, I don't know if you caught all of that, but so basically, when they, um, before they get into the whole knowledge production thing, so the thing about knowledge production is it's a combination of saying what is and it's an authority. Now... If you look in a lot of reactionary circles nowadays, what they'll do is they'll talk about something called the cathedral. So that's that that, that is treating society as a religion. So you get um you like you get a secular atheistic religion that treats politics in a religious sense, in order to create this sort of captured environment in which all of the ways of making sense of the world and producing moral codes and producing knowledge is subservient to the uh, to a stable structure of political power um and so this is something that that someone called michel foucault came up with but he didn't advocate for it he claimed that this is what society always was so that there is no real morality there is just power and the subjugation of one person by another in these binary power relationships um and so this is inherited by intersectionality and blah 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 fish paste so what's happened recently is that people who've who've been raised on Foucault have turned to actually deliberately recreating the world that he pretended the real world was. And so rather than having people who earnestly believe in some kind of moral system, you've got this whole class of people who cynically manipulate empty symbols in order to control what m uh, much of the lower society believes. And the cathedral, as the, the reactionaries sort of talk about it, is this layer of society that includes uh, scientists, social scientists, you know, like, and philosophers and all kinds of people, and then the journalists and so on. And their job is to be, as activists, um, to create constant justification for uh, power in the name of a certain set of ideological structures. Um, and, you know, this is, this is the leftward motion of history since 1945. Um, pretty much consensus. So, yeah, Daniel Schmachtenberger is very good. I think that, uh, you know, if you want to, you can check that out. So now the thing about him is what he what he he's he's managed to miss some of these details. So in, he doesn't see, he sees you know um, the sense making system as Schmachtenberger will see the sense making system as sort of like dirty and clogged up and confused. But what's really happened is that you've got you've you've got the these institutions have been corrupted by rather than having a, an earnest belief that they positively believe in. 
um, and understand about it. There's a kind of um, there's a kind of cynicism baked into the system um, because it's constantly skeptical. So instead of promoting its own positive worldview, it instead criticizes and keeps uh, keeps at bay a whole bunch of demons. So instead of you focusing on what you're positively believing, you're focused on attacking things that are not this belief. So you have this sort of strange, hidden, almost occult religion that dominates society. Occult meaning hidden or occluded, like a cloud is in front of it. So this, this modern religion that you see that flows from sort of Cartesian um, philosophy and enlightenment philosophy, where everything's founded on reason, which is this, reason is just a tool we used to, to talk about the world. So it's sort of like they, they hide their beliefs around the mechanisms they use to, uh, to empower them. And this is a very, very strange, th th this also gives you this strange idea of special or magic knowledge. And you'll find a similar sort of, the Western esoteric tradition contains a lot of these a great deal. So before I get too into the weeds of um, things like Gnosticism and so on, I'm going to read the article in Jijek, which is brutally long. And you are all sure to be bored to tears. Um, but uh, hopefully you won't. Um, sure, but I, ooh, I've only got a little water left. Mm. I should have filled that up before I started the stream, but here we go. So let's share this now. Ah, Zizek. So I call this instrumental ecumenism. So ecumenism is, of course, uh, it, it's it's about sort of in, uh, bringing the, the the believers community, the believing community together, and sort of looking at what they believe and synthesizing their practices and bringing them together and sort of sewing everything together. So now, um, Roger Scruton, I'm. He uh, before I begin, I'm just going to read the last paragraph because there's a couple of sentences of this essay that he wrote about Zizek. And he says, as in 1789, as in 1917, as in the long march of Mao, the great leap forward and the cultural revolution, the work of destruction feeds on itself. Zizek's windbaggery serves one purpose, to turn attention away from the actual world, from real people, and from ordinary moral and political reasoning. It exists to promote a single and absolute cause, the cause that admits of no criticism and no compromise and, offers, and that offers redemption to all that espouse it. And what is that cause? The answer is there on every page of Zizek's writings, nothing. So, of course, what Roger Scruton is saying is that Zizek basically is talking a load of bullshit because he's always all of these obscure, silly symbolisms and so on. And what I'm what I sort of say here is Roger Scruton's approaching this wrong. This is look. I grew up watching Slavoj Zizek, a man whose life aim is to revitalize the left. Well, I'm no longer a leftist, but reading Roger Scruton or other conservatives on Zizek and reading the responses that Zizek's followers give, one gets the clear impression that the Scrutons and Zizek's of the world are not on the same wavelength. There's something very different at a fundamental level with the two traditions of Western philosophy that makes them struggle to criticize each other effectively. And it is largely a function of the adjustments made for the intended audience. As dense as the prose of an analytical philosopher can be, they have a set of ethical constraints on their writing style. They must address all readers regardless of their persuasion or level of knowledge. They must write clearly and set out their premises and conclusions unambiguously and transparently. To read a faithful adherent of the analytical tradition is like drinking cool spring water. It is deliberately naive, serving to promote intellectual honesty, even at the cost of occasional irrelevance. But if the analytic offers us water, the continental philosopher offers us hundred-proof grain alcohol. Their writings are heady, provocative, symbolic, cynical, and speak to an inside audience familiar with the narratives of play. Slavoj Zizek offers a vast systematic political imagery, communicated to those already in on the game, an epistle to the faithful. He repeats, particularly recently, a certain string of themes, among which is a certain notion of political Christianity. 
He makes much of his work about revealing the religious aspects of ordinary life. Fetishism, ritual, disavowal, the genius and the apostle, the big other, and other quasi-theological Lacanianisms. His response to the painful fading effect of the opiate of the masses is to snort a line and call to Cthulhu. All, by the way, Cthulhu is the, the sort of um, ineffable, monstery, old bugger, demon thing that uh, pervades a lot of uh, Lovecraft's philosophy. Um, all discussion of ideology consists of only two matters, rhetoric and ethics. Um, rhetoric is the symbolic, evocative means of justifying what you want done. Ethics is what to do. Most liberals, conservatives, and reactionaries believe that it is only necessary to dismiss leftists like Zizek and that their rhetoric is hollow and meaningless. But it means a great deal to his audience, aside from his entertaining mannerisms. He is at the heart of the leftist establishment and is a bellwether for its vulnerabilities. What we want to know is, what is he selling us? In other words, what is a religion? Better academics than I have already worked very hard to produce comprehensive pictures of the religious architecture of postmodern identity politics. Pluck, Rose, Lindsay, and Bogosian have the most popularly accessible approaches to the matter that I know of. Mine is simpler and might be a little contentious, but I aim to describe more than just intersectionality, which is a small sect of a greater church. Crudely speaking, morality is a set of community-bound rules of conduct. Identity, that is doctor, carpenter, priest, laborer, black, white, mother, father, queer, comedian, is the means by which roles and moral duties are allocated. These roles embody the duties which maintain the structure of all institutions, which are, after all, no more than a collection of hierarchically structured roles, which enforce context-specific duties. Each community recognizes its members by adherence to recognized roles and rules of conduct and by the use of certain rhetoric and visual cues. In-group, out-group. And each community has a prime membership criterion to which all members ascribe, a common quality or goal easily articulated. For Christians, it is devotion to Christ. For the Nazis, it is devotion to the blood and the soil. If they deviate in some respects, they can still be considered ecumenical, provided they are deemed to accept loyalty to the same basic truth or belief. For intersectionists, this is the notion of social justice, as contrasted with group privilege. By erasing the significance of all other identities, except those which are determined by class, creed, and biology, the postmodern intersectionalists achieve the erasure of all institutions of Western society by obliterating the powers and duties institutional roles grant apart from biological identity, from the scientific method to the rule of law. But these people are merely a small sect of a much larger church, of which Marxism is the greatest branch. The New Testament to the Moses-like exodus of French revolutionaries from the lands of the Ancien Régime. To the Marxists, other modernists are still all Jews, clinging to bourgeois notions of property, hierarchy and class, free enterprise and inquiry, when we should be embracing the Aryan fervor of the divine messiah. By the way, for anyone who's not acquainted, uh, that doesn't mean Aryan like, you know, blonde people. It's Aryan as in um, a, a Christian heresy from, from the old days. So in their efforts at fighting radical doubt and nihilism, 20th century Christian Orthodox hierarch monk Seraphim Rose and 12th century titan of Islamic philosophy Abu al-Ghazali both argued in their own way that skeptical philosophical reasoning can only destroy beliefs by demonstrating their contradictions, can, sorry, can only destroy their beliefs. But can, so they're, they're not creative, they're just destructive, you know, skepticism breaks things down. All belief systems can be taken apart and seen to be contradictory, or they can be consistent but merely descriptive, and therefore morally nihilistic. And this is the trouble with empiricism and the limits of the utility of science. All moral propositions can be doubted, but people tend to doubt those things which are most favorable to their selfish and hedonistic impulses, as Theodore Dalrymple argues most eloquently in his essay, In Praise of Prejudice, which, by the way, if you want to read something, I'll knock your socks off, go read that. This skeptic use of reason can also be employed in service of power to destroy political opposition. This is the meaning of to problematize. 
to cast into doubt any axiom taken for granted by the traditional systems of society. In traditional, uh, in traditional philosophical logic, propositions are either necessary or problematic. So now, the necessary, these are technical words, you know. So the necessary is that which is beyond doubt. And the problematic is that which is open to reasonable skepticism. So all systems of belief and logic must rest on axioms of one kind, which Russell and Whitehead, the, these are philosophers and mathematicians, discovered to their dismay, must simply be assumed. So they attempted to prove necessary the axioms which ground all mathematics and all logic, thereby providing indubitable foundations for all philosophical thought. But as their colleague Kurt Gödel demonstrated, a system cannot be complete and consistent. If it is to account for all things, it will produce contradictions. And if it wishes to avoid contradictions, it must, be, uh, must refrain for, from accounting for everything. What axioms you adopt then depends on what sort of system you wish to build. And I believe the same applies in human philosophy as much as it does in mathematics and raw formal logic. Meta-mathematics and meta-ethics serve analogical functions. We all rely, at base, on some indubitable article of faith. Reason produces truth. Human rights are the foundations of morality. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. All history is class struggle. All inequality is the result of group-based privilege. Whichever one of those slogans you want to adopt. But how do we derive moral axioms? Al-Ghazali and Seraphim Rose both believe that it relies in... It, that, that, that's a typo. Uh, both be uh, believe that it lies in recognizing transcendental truths, in the notion of revelation or inspiration. So Kierkegaard, a favorite of Zizek's, makes the distinction between the ordinary man, who can only be an apostle, and the divine genius, in the sense of uh, genius meaning spirit, it's a old sense of the word, it doesn't, doesn't mean sort of hyper-intelligent dude, it just means spirit of jesus christ so the genius brings the truth from on high and the rest of us merely interpret it as as, as faithful apostles the truth is revealed it isn't merely discovered though much that is true is discovered both seraphim and al-ghazali lived in a secular environment and were known as astute scholars adept at the use of philosophical reason but both had a profound crisis of meaning in their lives and returned to the deepest orthodoxies of their upbringing. Eugene Rose renounced his homosexuality and his scholarship on Oriental mysticism and became an orthodox hieromonk. He wrote a dramatic and comprehensive condemnation of all modern ideas in a book he called The Dialectic of Nihilism, tracking how progressive liberalism, racial nationalism, and revolutionary communism all result inevitably in a corrupt and satanic destiny for society. And after wandering in the desert, Al-Ghazali came to realize the truth that only through ineffable inspiration could any truth be known. And without it, life is sterile and nihilistic. So he returned to his sublime object and wrote the most famous work of Islamic philosophy, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Opportunistic scholars and rulers used it to justify the purging of heterodox and non-Islamic thought for centuries, ending the golden age of Islamic civilization. In fact, this is a big deal because a lot of the the the, the big um, early scientific and um, philosophical writings that we have um, were translated by scholars in the Arabic world who were some were Zoroastrians, some were Syriac Christians, some were Muslims. Um, but yeah, that community in in Baghdad, uh, they they allowed a lot of the stuff that formed the basis of our of the Renaissance to be carried forward into Europe. So these men had in their mind certain facts. Why would we go to church if we did not believe in God? Why would we submit to dietary law if we did not believe Muhammad was the divine prophet? Why would you rely on mathematical truth if you did not believe that there was a reliable axiomatic foundation? In other words, to paraphrase Dostoevsky, why do good if there is no God? We live in a world in which these questions have largely been asked and answered for the greater part of Western society, but there is one religion which retains countless faithful, and whose rituals are attended daily by millions, and whose jubilees elect the leaders of the world. But what gave rise to these affairs? In other words, what is a revolutionary? 
The shocks of the late 19th century have given rise to a total inheritance of our meta-ethical schemes today. The very notion of human rights were not given to mankind by ratiocination, but by a violent social disruption, a turmoil of unimaginable intensity that gave rise to a wave of genocide and repression, which eventually led to the installation of the Napoleonic Code across the continent. While thinkers of the post-revolution, who saw property rights and equality before the law as sufficient, resisted further relentless revolution, many of the intellectual inheritors of this event believed it, ha um, it had been betrayed by not being carried to its conclusion. And as bursts of reaction and revolution rumbled across the continent for the next century, those who valued the total inversion of all social values, the abolition of all traditional institutions, and the leveling of all society, the liberation of all animal urges, and the erasure of national boundaries, took the mantle of the revolution and held up revolution as a good in itself to be pursued until humanity lived in heaven on earth. These men and women have used the language of the rights of man, today called human rights, to pursue the end of their program. Though some have no need for a moral framework and need only to recognize something called the event. Now, the event is, is, is this idea in, uh, in the philosophy of someone called Alain Badiou, who's a, who's a uh, big influence on Savo Zizek, and he talks about the event being some kind of transcendental experience like uh, falling in love or uh, or a revolution it's like a spontaneous rupture of what structures your whole world and realigns all of your desires and orders and things and beliefs around achieving this great transcendental union with something else anyway the woke left has a certain aim derived from the academic catechisms they learned as undergrads after all, the academy is just a modern descendant of the monastic cloister. This is literally true. But the articles of faith and ritualistic pronouncements by which we distinguish this new wave of idolatry are not the end of the system of beliefs that were authored in the 19th century. As many of the 20th century authors of this tradition, some of them heavily cited, uh, claim it was an instrumental choice to recruit multiple... Which one is this one? I can't remember what that is. Uh, it was an instrumental choice to recruit multiple antagonistic strategies into the destruction of Western civilization. Underneath it all, every postmodern intersectionalist agrees on two things in the concrete. Capitalism must be destroyed, and so, much the, so must the nation state. Laws and morals are just systems of control. And even some liberals and democratic socialists see capitalism as the enemy. As I contend, anti-capitalism is communism via negativa. So via negativa is the idea of you head in one direction sort of by pushing away from every other direction, you know. But since the Leninist project is dead, today you can only destroy freedoms of enterprise by producing anarchy or world government. The conflation of the two, which is capitalism and Western civilization, seems an extravagant excess but it is easy enough to understand why it is done. Lenin saw colonialism as the highest form of capitalism. The Frankfurt School, horrified by the Third Reich, saw it as the culmination of the dialectic of Western culture, and as such believed that to prevent um, Auschwitz from reoccurring, one has to dismantle all of its precursory institutions. Rosa Luxemburg uh, had already formed the essential dichotomy the slogan that was that is still used a lot in, in left-wing circles today, socialism or barbarism. These are like a binary choice. And third world revolutionaries like Fanon adopted these arguments to indict Western culture as a whole for the excesses at its military peripheries. Mao made this process of destroying one's heritage universal in the Cultural Revolution. And the May 68 revolt produced a slew of Maoists who hid their Maoism when it ceased being fashionable. And became and became known as postmodernists, an overly broad generalization, but it'll do for now. So this link here is to a book by uh, an intellectual historian called Richard Wolin, and it's called The Wind from the East. Um, so if you if you want to check that out, it's extremely interesting, um, and it discusses basically why all of those people are quite nuts. Um, uh, but anyhow. Uh, a communist, just like a Muslim or a Christian, can adjust his ideology to almost any change of the facts. If this were not true, they would not exist today. 
Just how communists in the Marxist tradition survive into the modern day where nothing resembles the justifications for the original theories is to a lot of people a mystery. But it's simple enough. All ethical schemes or moral codes have a basic set of axioms on which they are based or united by. And Marxism is no different. Zizek accuses the accusers of cultural Marxism of conspiracy theory. And for the most part, he is correct. Uh, ooh. Uh, for yeah, most accusers acquired the term first or second hand from Andrew Breitbart, who is not exactly known as a scholar of philosophy. And that's why Zizek can easily demand, show me the Marxists in a debate with Jordan Peterson. I, some of you might remember this thing. Because provoke, uh, proving that someone was a communist when the academy pretends that they aren't makes one look like a McCarthyist loony. Of course, nowadays, no one makes any attempt to dis uh, disguise that they're socialists. It's, um, the last few years have been a pretty radical change. So this makes for painful viewing, this debate between Jordan and Jordan Peterson, Salvage. But this is a straw man. There is a non-conspiratorial way of articulating this narrative. Zizek knows full well that what the Frankfurt Project was, which is attacking Western cultural institutions in service of communism, he knows who Althusser was, who is a Stalinist, and he knows what Marcuse was up to, which is adapting Maoism for an American audience. So as I've already covered in a different essay, there are three basic Marxian axioms, which serve to systematically perpetuate the revolutionary project. One, morality is a historically contingent social system determined by class domination. So basically this means that all morality is, there's no objective morality. It all just comes out of the social system that, that the ruling class builds in order to create more control. Right? Two, transgressing it is virtuous, overthrowing it is imperative. So sort of it, it, there's a sort of uh, performative contradiction over here so morality is something that's just created by power but we have to overturn this power by dismantling its morality its moral systems and its political systems and its economic systems and then he says all disagreement is the product of false consciousness and false consciousness is a simple idea it means you're basically brainwashed you're acting against your interests you're basically the psychic slave of the ruling class with these basic ingredients, one may remain faithful to the revolution without needing to be bothered with any of the elements of Marxist economics or fiddly details revolving around the distribution of resources. You can serve the overthrow of any system whatsoever and ablate any moral reservations, even criticize Marx himself for being insufficiently revolutionary. If your creativity or authenticity is in question, find a new way to instantiate class or group struggle to portray ordinary behavior as subservience to hegemonic power structures maintained by economic or libidinal exploitation. It doesn't matter that, psychoanal that psychoanalysis is unscientific. It serves a powerful role to empower rhetoricians to accuse anyone and everyone of being trapped in a false consciousness without ever having to wrestle with the truth. Many students employ this naively as a sincere mode of inquiry. But what happens when a fully self-aware scholar embraces these strategies and moral frameworks and employs them to create devotion to a global revolution? And now we get to Zizek himself. Slavoj Zizek is, of course, a self-admitted Marxist. While he has some criticism of Marx, he clearly operates off a vast quantity of Marxist theory and embraces the Marxist meta-ethic. His return to Hegel is not essentially different in broad, low-definition sense, of course, from the efforts of the Gramsci's, critical theorists, and postmodernists of the world, who sought to retire from the material determinism of the orthodox, Mar orthodox Marxists in exchange for the tools of cultural critique to problematize morality and social roles, disrupting and co-opting institutions to the ultimate goal of all revolutionaries. Zizek, as a follower of Alain Badiou, believes in utter fidelity to the event, which for all intents and purposes means the revolution, though occasionally he uses it to describe falling in love, any kind of disturbing occasion that totally realigns one's social reality. He calls himself a Stalinist, though often enough he disavows the crimes of Stalin as brutal, which is, I suppose, sounds like a contradiction, sounds confusing. He just wants a strong bureaucratic state so that he can mind his own business in anonymity, which, you know, this is what he says, but it's a curious trait for one who's so enamored of the academic limelight. It's a curious contradiction, made serious by the way in which he chokes, but then turns around to preempt his critics. 
So he says here, uh, don't fall into this trap of, I almost did an impression of him just now. <laughs> it's, it's, he says, like, don't fall into this trap of portraying the executors, even of Stalin, Stalin's crime as evil, sneering individuals pursuing private goals. The most horrible evil is the evil inscribed into the basic functioning of institutions themselves. This was performed by people who thought that they were doing a good thing, their patriotic duty. Okay. But I believe that this disavowal is merely disavowal. A concept I learned from Zizek himself. So there's this little uh, thing where he explains it. I don't, I'm not going to bother sharing it for, for now. Uh, as he often likes to repeat, if he walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, don't let him fool you. He is a duck. So the reason I believe him to be a duck is a result of two of his strongest recent public statements. First, as he, op as he states openly, I don't have any problems with this strong state power. So he has told us what uh, communism would mean practically. Uh, there needs to be some transnational universal agency. That's all that communism means for me. Interesting. So the EU, for him, is an essential vehicle of progress towards communism. Its democratic deficit is not a bug, but a feature. He longs for international police forces, hates popular consent, hates populism. He likes to repeat a conversation he had with Yanis Varoufakis. The populists, so according to Yanis Varoufakis, he says, like, the populists are manipulating the people. You know? But Slavoj Žižek disagrees, and he says that populism is genuine dissent. But what means do we have to counter-manipulate them, he goes on to say, except strong state power? If the people are wrong, we have a duty to crush them. If the state is wrong, we have a duty to betray it. The true progressive acts against the majority when the majority is wrong. Acts of political courage are justified retroactively. The ends justify any means available. I mean, he has a point here, you know. You can't allow Nazis to run roughshod over the flower of your civilization. And the Assanges and the Snowdens of the world are good people, doing what is right and sacred by telling the truth in a world gone bad. But he's proposing what he's proposing is a totalitarian, anti-democratic world government with no hope of escape, no freedom to engage in pleasure or enterprise. He's under no illusions as to the mechanisms he proposes either. Recalling the, recall the quote about Stalinism above. The ideal form of political activism, Zizek says, is not the work of an inspired genius. It is the work of a dogmatic, unthinking, repetitive automata. Apostles. Remember Kierkegaard from earlier. This is the grounds upon which he praises Greta Thunberg, a true believer who doesn't have the answers except that she has the true faith. He even delights in the visceral hatred she expresses, a sort of female toxic masculinity, he calls it. He must be aware of what he's encouraging here, like he often repeats on the subject of the German film Die Lieben des Anderen, the true horror, it, it's about East, uh, East Germany and the, 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 the Stasi spies that they had in every family and household. He says, the true horror is not that the state apparatus allows corrupt individuals to abuse power, but that good, decent people, merely carrying out what they perceive as their social duties in a corrupt system, will reproduce these gross injustices. It is the subsumption of the bulk of society into the role of unconscious instruments, while the intellectual decodes the instructions from the superego. East Germany, then, is a society of unconsciously directed apostles, his ultimate ideal. If there is no God, everything is permitted, says Dostoevsky. Not so, says Zizek, through, via Lacan. He says, if there is God, then everything is permitted in his name. But Zizek does not believe in God. He just refuses to recognize it or to call his God, the event, by any name recognizable to an outsider, as if it is an eldritch Lovecraftian other. The above axioms only function when there is something to dismantle. Once the foundations are gone, the liberal elite has grown comfortable in their self-serving whinging, binging, and autoflagellation, and the academic left settles into the position of priest class. The right now uses the rhetoric of transgression to erode the gains of the left, and even Zizek is caught in a spin. He realizes that he cannot simply come out in favor of a totalitarian crackdown on ideological dissent.
There is no escaping the popular resentment of the left, particularly the hypercritical and self-serving adoption of its ideological products by the liberal elite. Treaties in the EU and the UN serving its end are passed out in secret, and the true believers hide behind ironic distance. Their codes are as dead as the Nazis. In the face of the new right tr uh, transgressions, Zizek hopes to present a civil front to demonstrate the authority of a moral code, or at least he just sort of suggested the idea. He doesn't really carry it through. But this would require sincerity, and this is the one thing the left strategy never embodied. What is this strategy? Some of you have noticed that I'm quoting only Zizek's public utterances, not his academic texts. This is for two reasons. One, it was easier to do, and two, it is the primary means by which people engage with Zizek and the most prominent means of propagating his ideas. He does a lot of public speeches. He does a lot of public articles. All of these things that he does, it's, yeah. In the most recent public appearances promoting his upcoming book, um, a man in the audience asks uh, the question about the increasing proliferation of fourth wall breaking cinema and self-aware current affairs propaganda. So think like, uh, you know, all of the stuff since John Stewart. So like your Trevor Noah's and your, um, what's that other wanker, the British guy? Um, John Oliver. So like those guys, right? So Zizek responds by turning to the camera that's filming the, <laughs> that's actually filming the, um, what do you call it, the, the, the lecture. And he describes a scene from old television show, show Perry Mason. I'm sure everyone knows Perry Mason. A couple is caught in evidence of a murder. The husband begins to confess in excruciating detail, and Mason is perplexed. Why would he confess so completely under no duress? until he realizes that it is the performance of an official story for the wife to repeat under questioning for the purposes of avoiding prosecution. The moral of the story is that understanding the audience for whom the fourth wall is broken is the key to decoding the dramatic device. So this is a nod to the purpose of the entire process of leftist theory, you know, critical theory. That is, the manufacturing of tools of rhetorical strategy. And just like Mahmoud Mamdani handed the keys to his critics by explaining what he meant by decolonization, that's another essay. I, I think I did that before. So Zizek has handed the key to explaining his entire purpose. All discussion of ideology consists of only two matters, rhetoric and ethics. Rhetoric is the evocative, symbolic, or rational means of justifying what you want done, and ethics is what to do. But ethics and rhetoric are seldom discussed explicitly in leftist circles, except to disrupt the discourse of outsiders. What to do is already understood in the grand scheme of things. Only strategy matters. So you see, they've got this. So the, like the Christian or the Muslim uh, dogma is an exoteric dogma. It's out there. You can see it. But the leftist dogma is an esoteric dogma. Their actual end goal is always obscured. I mean, look, there are texts out there you can read like, uh, that, that actually explain it in a direct sense, like uh, Karl Marx's um, uh, essay on Hegel's philosophy of right really, really gets into exactly how everything looks. But most people keep saying, oh, we don't really want this. We don't really want that outcome. We don't really want this. And so you're left doubting, well, what do they actually want? And you end up like Roger Scruton saying, oh, he's offering nothing. So it's nihilistic. which. Father Serum from for Rose would say, yes, this is nihilism in a specific sense, but that's not really, that's a whole other rabbit hole now. So what you may or may not do is grounded in deeper ideas of right and wrong, but in whatever serves to, dis is, is not grounded in deeper ideas of right and wrong, but in whatever serves to destroy traditional institutions and promote revolution for its own sake. Why quibble over right and wrong? Morality is so bourgeois, you know? Um, the, you, I mean, you can see this. The, the left will always sort of say things are like, oh, you know, that's so white. That's so like capitalist. Oh, that's like outdated. It's like, oh my God. It's, it's like leftists are all like valley girls. They always, it's always pop culture. It's always, if you know, sort of superficial shit. Um, it's always an attempt to shy away from anything that might seem earnest or, um, you know, uncool. And that goes up to like really old academics as well. And, and Slavoj Žižek is really deep in this because anytime you get people get close to saying, 
is this what you mean? He goes, no, of course not. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm a this. So he spends his whole career saying, well, he's actually a Marxist. He's looking for this kind of revolution as described by Marx in his critique of Hegel. But then in public, he'll say, no, actually, I'm a Hegelian. <laughs> and so it's 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 really funny. I mean, there's an, there's uh, I'll, I'll explain exactly in which sense he is a Hegelian if 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 people want that question answered because it's still true. It's just there's a lot of ambiguity he likes playing with in order to serve certain ends. Anyway, the revolution becomes a mystical font of all inspiration and the end of all activity, just as Christ is to the Christians or the Father of the land is to the fascists. On the left, we can discuss imperatives, but never in the sense that they are moral only as practice, a what to do to get what we are allowed to want. Zizek, like a good psychoanalyst, substitutes morality for desire, since like all good revolutionaries, psychoanalysts do not believe in right and wrong, or at least they don't talk about it. It is why they make such good bedfellows. Morality is instrumental, a tool of desire, of power, and authority is mere projection. As George R. R. Martin would say, it's a shadow on the wall. Or as Lacan would say, it's the big other. There is no authority. There's no morality. The symbolic references which hold the roles, duties, and norms of society together are just a medium for the cowardly concealment of one's true desires, which can never be fulfilled. Only by enslaving yourself to the cause, professing faith in the event, can you escape the compulsive concealment of your eternal biologically inborn dissatisfaction. This is like a good Buddhist guru promoting your, uh, promising that your dukkha will be sated if you help him burn down the pagan temples. Um, I don't know how much you know about Buddhism, but basically dukkha is this idea that all experience in, in life is, is pervaded by a, a, a sense of unsatisfactoriness, which keeps us moving forward and desiring things and acting. Um, and you can't escape, you, you can, uh, it's, the, the closest thing you can come to escaping it is to accept it, to accept this constant impingement. But the Western esoteric tradition and the Western Enlightenment tradition, particularly as explained by someone like Spinoza, says that all of these impingements of desire and unsatisfactoriness and insufficiency in the world must be materially satisfied so that you can go on free reasoning as as a detached subject just why descartes has this idea of the the subject being different from the body so he doesn't even talk about like the spirit or the soul it's this subject the self which exists beyond the body and the material world and the sensations it's very very strong dualism morality was once the core of sociology and is only making a comeback in very recent years through the influence of Marxists, postmodernists, and psychoanalysts, morality has almost entirely evaporated from the social sciences as like something that people analyze and study. They don't, you know, they, they largely didn't study morality. And this is a this is a link to a book by um, a, a couple of academics called Hitlin and Weissy. And they basically talk about how they, they did a study of all of these major journals and showed how talk about morality is quite disappeared from, from uh, right up until very recently in the last few years and decades you've seen it reemerge. Um, so he says, uh, and thereby from the minds of all the educated elites from the Western world, they merely have norms or codes of conduct which are purely instrumentally employed to serve, off, to serve far off political ends and the policing of ecumenical communities of liberation and progress. It's also transparent to anyone watching that leftist watching that leftists talk of morality is entirely instrumental. Morality was oppressive until Trump and the rest of the new right started flaunting the norms adopted by the liberals from the far right edu far left educators. Rights for thee, but not for me. How about how about rights for D's nuts? Carpe pudendum. You know, Trump have has this. Um, has a sort of fuck you approach to that kind of pseudo moralizing that that he's confronted with um and i think a lot of people on the right are, sort of have that as well it's not we're not sitting here reasoning with the opposition we know that they don't mean us well they know we know that they're not honest so we just say no we're not doing that which is the right thing to do i think 
In the everyday, the strategy is to identify the most prominent Western or global political talking points and subject them to a basic evaluation. Can it be construed as domination? This is what the left does, of course. Um, does it serve to immanentize the eschaton or not? That means to bring about the the, the apocalypse, um, the, end, the end times, which for the left is this revolution, this utopia. Such was the work of La Clue and Mouffe and of Kimberley Crenshaw when they instrumentally integrated race, sex, sexuality, and class, following groundwork set by the left since Kojeve. And such is the work of the left for the past century. Two things are utterly essential, hedonism and resentment. The metaphysical grounds of the European Christian meta-ethic, God, the divine right of kings, biblical morality, private property, freedom of enterprise, the rule of law, the family, male and female, objectivity, logical coherence, all had to be problematized and all relied on self-restraint and loving authority. What grounds, on what grounds were they problematized? First, because they made us unfree, and then on the grounds that freedom allowed inequality. This is hedonism and resentment. And Zizek is against hedonism. And you see, it's, it's, it's constantly a retreat into the self. You're entitled to pleasure, and you spite those that impose any kind of morality, moral duty on you. So you're pushing everything that is part of the world away to retreat into the self. Of course, much that was swept away is in fact oppressive. And Christianity was warped to serve trusted ends. How can that be denied? But the aim is to sweep away everything that could oppose communism or anarchy, and thus creating no alternative but submission. Are you mentally ill? Or is capitalism making you suicidal? Now, this is a link to um, uh, the Wikipedia article on Mark Fisher, um, who constantly made that precise argument that it was the structure of capitalist society that was making people suicidal and, and mentally ill. And then he killed himself and it he got a whole sort of, I mean, he's a, he's a very smart guy and he has a lot to say, but it's the, the, the sort of poetic circularity to that whole discussion. So it's don't, it's the thing is don't get productive, don't get well, get even. What the left have settled on collectively is a particular transcendental method which relies on the occult conjuration of ambiguous or slippery yet evocative concepts and a process of sifting through the mountain of new tools for justifying the means they prefer for attaining the end that they commonly desire. As Deleuze and Guattari stated, the whole purpose of philosophy is to manufacture new concepts. It's why so much French leftism is so full of bullshit. And bullshit is... Uh, Harry Frankfurt is very kind of it's kind of interesting as an American philosopher called Harry Frankfurt who wrote this um, essay called on bullshit and he describes bullshit as being different from lies because a lie you're deliberately deceiving someone so you you care about what the truth is because you're trying to know it and then you tell someone something that opposes the truth to get them to do something that else but bullshit is you don't care what's true or false you're just saying whatever achieves that result that you you desire this is the point is not to elucidate the truth as it is for the analytical tradition it is to in it is to generate tools for the propagation of the apostolic mission to fight the system everyone knows that psychoanalysis uh, psychoanalysis uh, la. everyone knows that psychoanalysis pretends to scientific pertinence uh oh what the how what what the bloody hell's going on? Everyone knows that psychoanalysis that pretends to psych scientific pertinence is bullshit. Well, there is no psychoanalysis with scientific grounds. Erich Fromm, uh, he's a critical theorist uh, from the Frankfurt School, meant that Freud was scientific in the same way that Marx was scientific. It's a claim to authority, not an argument from empirical rigor. So you can see like how a lot of people talk about science now. This is scientism. This is saying, well, the science agrees. Well, no, science is a process of figuring out something that's true enough for a certain purpose. Um, and there's always debate. There's always splits, even things that are quite well rehearsed. It's only the very, very certain things like you know physics and, and so on where you get perfect where you get close to perfect agreement on everything so the point of psychoanalysis for the left 
um, is the same as, uh, is the same function as mysticism and occultism had before it. It's a means of creating new, deep, symbolic language to manipulate the rhetorical landscape. So what he is doing is navigating high-level rhetorical strategies for signaling solidarity with the weak and the downtrodden, the marginal and the vulnerable. But while these people are in some sense real, they are, of course, merely images to be manipulated. So why not just admit it? The question is, what is disavowal? And as Slavo Zizek sort of sums it up, he says, I know, but I don't want to know that I know, so I don't know. So he talks about this sort of uh, pretend, it's almost like a pretending to go get along, but it's not a conscious pretending. It's sort of, a, it's almost hypnotic. It's like how little children will believe in Santa Claus. You know, uh, they sort of believe on behalf of the parents participating in a great game. Um, so the trouble is the right has made recent gains which are difficult to quantify. The old strategies of transgression and socialism or barbarism, that is expanding the circle of the alt-right or, or, or the Nazis to include even the bourgeois bohemian Boris Johnson, these, these strategies don't work anymore. One only needs to watch the over-exaggerated way in which Zizek defends and then simultaneously hesitates in defending tactics essential to the movement to see what he is really afraid of. His intellect is incredible, using psychoanalysis to sidestep the entire question of whether the transgender issue is a matter of mental illness or not. Right? Because it's either mental illness or it isn't, uh, because if it's mental illness, then you know, the best solution is therapy. If it's not mental illness, then what exactly is it? It's like some kind of transcendental religious experience of mind-body separation, and the true self is like this metaphysical entity that has to be satisfied in in the material world which in which it's trapped. So Zizek says, Psych a psychic sexual identity is a choice, not a biological fact. But it is not a conscious choice that the subject can playfully repeat and transform. It is an unconscious choice which precedes subjective constitution and which is, as, as such, formative of subjectivity, which means that the change of this choice entails the radical transformation of the bearer of the choice. So for him, he's making transgenderism um, the, the moment of realization of transgenderism, the same as falling in love or the revolution. It's this transcendental occult event that aligns the self with some kind of higher transcendental liberation, which then requires the manipulation and destruction of the material reality to conform with this spark of the divine which we have encountered. He's pointing out that there's something wrong with it, which I felt, but I think his model is kind of dodgy. So he's pointing out that there's something wrong with it, which I felt when I first encountered it, but was not confident or callous enough to articulate. Something like, it's something in the language, as, as Zizek would say. But he can't afford to address the issue as directly as the daring Douglas Murray has. He would be excommunicated. I mean, Douglas Murray is not a philosopher, but he is a very, very articulate public commentator. So Zizek picks on the notion of identity politics as a tool of class oppression. For white privilege, he toys with its popularity amongst white liberals. The romance of the noble savage, the self-flagellation of the white liberal, of course, is a subtle racist superiority, which shows that they have the moral superiority of the greatest self-denial. And he's right here. He can equally see how the tools used to decolon deconstruct the old belief systems are retarding the acceptance of direct appeals to communism and how liberal hypocrisy invalidates their views amongst the peasants. He can see that transgenderism is a horrifying derangement of our rational faculties and that open borders would lead to war in Europe. He, I, I should have embedded a link to that article, but he does write about this. He can see that humanitarian refugee solidarity is pitting two groups of the lower classes against each other, and that mass immigration will destroy Europe by generating a reactionary fascism. He can even see that decolonization ideologies lead to the collapse of third world nations, which rely on the global economy for survival, and quotes Huey Newton, 
to the to that effect. Black nationalists, of course, are always a useful authority on the left. I mean, notice how people quote Biko and Fanon when, even when they're not really authorities on a topic. It's like they're they're by writing a book, a black person a black person immediately becomes some kind of saint with a with contact to God or something. Um, instead of just being an ordinary person who's evaluated on the contents of our, their ideas. Anyway, he, he sees that environmental catastrophism is not a realistic picture of the world, and precisely this fact makes him fear the facts intruding to complicate matters, leading people to doubt the dogmatic message of environmental state control. So you can see that what, what he's, of course, saying, what he says mental times is that, well, the models actually are wrong. They're repeatedly wrong. It's not as dire as it really seems. But we really need this to happen to realize the world we need to realize. So we can't have people doubting the science. We can't question it. We need devotion, you see. So Zizek even goes so far as to say that using legal rights, like royalty, to protect all these identity-based claims of oppression is bad because it upholds the bourgeois legality. He then repeats, can we link our antagonisms? And this is regurgitating, you know, Marcuse, the 1968 Paris the uprisings, La Clue and Mouffe, and so on. But he has no solution to the problem that the left has created, which is passing on their ideology to a ruling class who has no interest in seizing the day. So you can see, I mean, it's it's like, you know, once people in the ruling classes are f can often be quite lazy. I mean, you look at the ANC right now, Almost every one of them is a true believer in the National Democratic Revolution, but they sort of like, eh, but there's money to be made right now, you know, or eh, life goes on. It'll come. They're sort of so certain in it, you know. They're so certain of this idea of progress that they feel that they don't really have to go out and get it. Um, so he says to offer the white Midlands of America some, he, 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 he suggests that we offer the white Midlands of America some pork. Of course, pork, this is a, this is a, um, an American bureaucratic slang to refer to sort of like welfare and, uh, make work schemes and, uh, big sort of tender projects to bring them over to the side of progress. He says that the way to do this is to move the democratic, democratic party to the economic left. But this isn't as true as it was four years ago when Sanders was a knockout over Trump. People have woken up. They have, they have different grievances now beyond economics. They see even more strongly than they have at any other time that the left is to be resisted. New radical right. I mean, Jesus, did you read? I don't know if anyone saw that. Um, there was a poll done recently asking how many Republicans, how many people who voted for Trump believe that Biden won the election, and it was 3%. Sorry, I'm going to turn the light on. 3%. I mean, that's a figure that is unheard of. You never, ever, ever get that result in polls. It is, it, it, it's, it's, there's a, there's a, a guy who I followed for a while called uh, uh, Scott Alexander. He has this fantastic blog that's now just archived called Slate Star Codex. And the others had this idea he called Lizard Man's Constant, which is, um, the one there was a survey which threw in a, a bizarre question at the end just to see if people would check it and say, do you believe that lizard men control the world? And there was like, you know, there was about like three or four percent of people who answered with that question. And he calls it lizard men's constant. So there's always some portion of people who give bullshit answers for whatever, like they'll just, ra they'll, they'll just fuck with the survey. And he found it sort of repeated in a lot of other funny surveys that he looked up. And what I'm, what you see here in this this new phenomenon of of everyone unanimously rejecting the the, the election result on the right. I mean, it's never happened before. Uh, clearly, even about like a third of the Democrat supporters actually believe that the vote was rigged, right? But by, by many polls, so. It's it's like the the the, the unanimity of, of believing that this was a rigged election is on the order of like stupid error. I mean it's it's unbelievable. Anyway, sorry, back to the back to the topic at hand. The new uh uh, they have different grievances now beyond economics. They see more than uh, more strongly than um, ever that they have at any other time that the left is to be resisted. New radical right-wing theorists have ri risen up, too mature for wild narcotic daydreams of primordial racism, with deeper criticisms of democracy than the flippant Zizek. 
When he says that the true obscenity of Trump is the things he says seriously, not his trolling, he treads on the banana peel. He says that call because he says that calling America great, that expressing patriotism and love of country and tradition is the real obscenity. This betrays the cynicism he runs on, and not in any oblique way, but in the way that even the least educated redneck can see through. The most popular Democratic candidate with Republicans was Tulsi Gabbard, a victim of the liberal establishment, a punching bag for the left, and a real serious old-fashioned military patriot. Of course, it doesn't hurt that she's ridiculously good-looking either, but um, the politicians ordinary people in America agree are bad are the squad who are thieving anti-American Bolsheviks, and I put links to all of the ugly crap that they've, uh, they've gotten up to. Um, so Zizek wishes to get conservatives who oppose the social revolution on deeply held principles to fall for the left by bribing them with welfare. What kind of evangel is this? And so then what is love? Zizek has said many times that the revolution and falling in love are one and the same process, a transcendental event. It is a submission, a surrender of control and autonomy to embrace a love of the other. And in a way, he is right. A principled reaction to injustice and the impulse to protect those one loves come from the same place. But the interplay of the personal and the universal is a ticklish subject. Sorry, I'm being... That's such a fucking cheesy pun. He, he wrote a book called The Ticklish Subject. Anyway, the revolution is an expression of a love of the world, universal love. So he claims to be a Christian in a sense, pushing this universal love. But it is a peculiar understanding of an old Christian come because he says that like only an atheist can be a true Christian. It's this very weird sort of thing that he's doing, right? This, this is a peculiar understanding of an old Christian command to love thy neighbor, this universal love, right? Who is my neighbor? It's a well-trodden ground in Christian ethics. But as Dostoevsky put it, the more I love humanity in general, the less I love man in particular. In my dreams, I often make plans for the service of humanity, and perhaps I might actually face crucifixion if it were suddenly necessary. Yet I'm incapable of living in the same room with anyone for two days together. I know from experience, as soon as anyone is near me, his personality disturbs me and restricts my freedom. In 24 hours, I begin to hate the rest of ma man. One, because he's too long over his dinner, and another because he has a cold and keeps on blowing his nose. I become hostile to the people the moment they come close to me. But it has always happened that the more I hate men individually, the more I love humanity. Now, this is an interesting thing. So there's a tweet I responded to a while ago where there was someone saying how everyone likes this idea of community, but do they really want to deal with being woken up in the middle of the night with neighbors' complaints and intervening to make peace between people and going to cheesy little local events and supporting you know, people doing inane things? And I sort of, I, I actually reflected on this a minute and I actually realized I don't mind it. And I think there's a lot of people who don't mind it, you know, being bugged by people who genuinely need your help, you know, um, and dealing with the sort of weird messiness of, of local community or family even, you know, you just deal with family. It can be hard. It can be horrible, I suppose, for a lot of people, but there are ways of dealing with almost every kind of community issue. So anyway, what could more perfectly describe the prickly antisocial Zizek who calls his students boring idiots and prides himself on his disgust for personal interaction and eschews the individual and holds fantasies of political solipsism? I've occasionally felt the same. I mean, who hasn't had an encounter with a psychophant, a charlatan, a sadist, or someone with bad personal hygiene? I've occasionally felt the opposite, in fact, as well. Sometimes in the heat of my frustration, I've spontaneously fantasized about nuclear holocaust, violent vengeance of political enemies, in the abstract at least. But I'm curbed the minute I remember their humanity and remember that what I hate them for is usually them acting on the very emotions that I feel all too often myself. Of course, it would be a straw man to say that, his, that Zizek's political universal ethic lines up with his philosophy of personal love. He eloquently expresses the relationship between his views of the two. He says, I don't like the world. I'm basically someone in between. I hate the world or I'm indifferent towards it. 
but the uh, but the whole of reality is just it's just that it's it's stupid it's out there i don't care about it love for me is an extremely violent act love is not i love you all love means i pick out something and you know again it's the structure of imbalance even if the something is just a small detail a fragile individual person i say i love you more than anything else and in this quite formal sense love is evil so that's a really weird thing he says so why would he say love is evil well because it's contrary to this universal love that is embedded in his philosophy it's a really perverse thing where it's based on abstract categories that don't match human beings like if you discriminate between people of different ethnicity that's that's the or or um or different creeds or you discriminate pe against people based on their lifestyles or on any basis whatsoever that's considered the prime evil uh, of of universalist progressive ideas so the, even the idea of national boundaries is an absolute tyranny in the same sense as apartheid was for these people right it's exactly how they see these things and so the very idea of privileging any one person out of it is is that everyone on the left realizes that this is actually kind of a violation and so you'll see promotions of polyamory and promiscuity going going above because a radical commitment to any one person to one community to one task to one to one career all of these things are horrible tyrannies and a sign of a mind that is incapable of letting go of prejudice um, and structure in life to embrace the universal so he is right to notice this kind of conflict the, the moral imperatives of the revolution have no time for human love they're too busy leveraging the hypocrisy of the virtuous zizek see by the, by with that i mean not everyone can always live up to the, the virtues that they they live up to so the, the 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 revolutionaries will point out how the how people who still cling to what they consider outdated morality are actually hypocritical because everyone's a hypocrite to some degree um except saints and the messiah and so, anyway, Zizek sees the futility of personal recycling schemes in the grand narrative of planetary collapse and condemns it, a synecdical representation of individual action, as vanity. So you recycle for your vanity and what you really need to be doing is building a global government to control the economy. This is why Zizek mistakes the individual self-improvement of Jordan Peterson for Pharisaism, which is the performance of personal superficial acts to placate the superego. Um, you know, the Pharisees were people who obeyed the letter of the Jewish law without embracing anything of its spirit. That was the main criticism. So, in Zizek's view, in order to escape accusations of environmentalist hypocrisy, we recycle. If we think of criticizing the system, we are instantly reminded of the hypocrisy of our personal consumption and turn quiet. He wishes us to cut through the fear of hypocrisy and surrender to the sublime event through activism. Hence his enthusiasm for Greta Thunberg's um, uh, apostolic fervor. His belief that the left is stronger than the right in the dimension of getting one's house in order. His house is on fire and he likes it that way. Eric Hofer talks about the movements. Talks about, he talks about movements as demanding a sacrifice from its members. Stripping them of autonomy and their spiritual strength demanding surrender and apostolic virtues like martyrdom and dogmatism in order to make the movement stronger. Now, Peterson offers is a different formula. Make yourself strong, make your family strong, make your community strong, so that when the time comes, you can band together and defend those you love from the unspeakable horror coming your way. Many people who resist totalitarian regimes or even run foul of their power do so because standing up for what is right for people right here right now tangible human lives can mean a profound violation of the unjust systems of law and government which prevail it's why the mere act of loving someone of another race was the most revolutionary act any system of apartheid uh, any citizen of apartheid south africa could embrace it, pl it tr uh, placed their most transcendent uh, intimate loyalties directly against the entire edifice of the state the highest ethical task, as Zizek sees it, is to weigh the question of who to die for in war, a particularly apposite insertion of Hegel. As a fallist, which is in many ways the most Hegelian of all ideologies, once told a Ugandan friend of mine who was troubled by the genocidal rhetoric, 
when shit starts burning, you'd better know which side you're on. Or as a white fallist, a friend of mine once posted to his Facebook page, when the revolution comes, it won't matter if you were a good person. In other words, the revolutionary should not go to war for a matter of justice to preserve our communities, our way of life, or even for the love of those near, for, near to us. We should war for human rights, for the revolution, destruction of all existing ways of life and the coming of a universal state in which all human life is merely instrumental. We should die for the United Nations, we should die for the European Union, we should die for the Soviet Union, we should die for the right to be anonymous, equal, isolated, bureaucratically managed slaves of the Antichrist. If the new morality is one which transcends locality and local loyalties, then where do the Snowdens of the global state go? The Assanges. If Zizek is right, then so is Orwell. The future is a boot stamping on a human face forever. And if that is the case, then the enemy of all mankind is revealed, the revolutionary. So, ooh, there's still some of you around. Goody gumdrops. So. Hello. I'm going to go back and I'm going to check some of your uh, questionies. And we can have a good chit-chat. Okay, so which are, ooh, I've been here for an hour and a half. I told you it was going to be a long essay. Um, so which of the Christian sect is the correct doctrine as all claim there's to be above all the others? A war is fought and each pray to their God taking inspiration from the same book. No, okay, so Nigel asked this. <sighs> Here's the real conundrum. You always face that question. The point of this essay is to say there's always some axiomatic, unreasoned foundation to everything that society binds itself together on. The main criterion which aligns all loyalty in society and directs it towards a common goal never has a rational foundation. Reason cannot produce axioms. Logic cannot produce axioms. Axioms are constructed and adopted as articles of faith. And you have to start somewhere in order to move forward in the world, right? And so when you bother about which Christian sect is the correct doctrine, you really do have to abandon all kinds of critical um rational inquiry as a means of achieving it it's it, it is a faith-based leap just as belief in human rights is you didn't get human rights by reasoning towards them you got human rights because you were told that's where morality in society comes from and it's a morality structured entirely by the state and what is this what is a human right they're completely arbitrarily adopted and usually by whether or not they appeal to um, a useful democratic demographic. And yeah, so it, it, it's completely nihilistic, uh, you know, right to this, right to that. Mm -mm. You know, none of these things have, rights are things which the state lets, uh, are, are, are exceptions the state creates to its own power. In other words, they're things that the state just like sort of allows you to have. And so in that sense, it's it's very weird. It's a way of structuring the basis of your social morality in terms of what politicians and powerful people want you to do or will allow or will allow you to do. Uh, skepticism works best in science, but you must know how to navigate, uh, navigate while wielding the tool of skepticism. Correct, John Smith. It is just a tool. You don't swing a, an ice pick at everything. Just Trotskyists. Um, Schmachtenberger, yeah, I addressed that one earlier. Afternoon, fellow intellectuals. Yes, we are all very smart here. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, which Christian sect has the best definitive understanding of the Bible? I go for the Eastern Orthodox, quite frankly. I mean, that, but that's a that's a discussion for another time. I just wanted to just to reiterate what I said before. Um. 
everything you believe in has has um, has an axiomatic foundation. And if you think you're a liberal and you're you know this liberal humanist, you're believing in the Enlightenment tradition, which is given to you by men who actually have an occult foundation for their um, for their belief system. Um, and instrumentally use reason and rationality to fend off criticism, but don't really have the foundations that they claim. And if you've spent enough time in, in, in philosophy, you end up with this sort of like dubious nihilistic void where every single philosophy is just something that you can easily poke a hole in by doubting the correct um, assumption. So, I mean, this is, this is what Al-Ghazali, who I mentioned earlier, um, did I mean, he? He was an extremely advanced um, uh, philosopher. He was considered the most respectable translator of classical texts in the Arabic world, and so he would tear apart the 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 philosophies of just about everyone um, fairly easily. And he, he reached the point where he felt so nihilistic and so void of certainty in in life that he just sort of he abandoned hope in morality or whatever and he just sort of left uh, his his post and he went traveling and he just he had to get away and then he had some little revelation in the desert actually no you have to assume meaning you have to rely on revelation and it has to come from somewhere immaterial and it's not just on like the, the level of religion it's much deeper than that it's even to have like a grasp understanding of anything in the world you don't sort of like plod along. I mean, I don't know if anyone's read like um, Daniel Kahneman System 1, System 2 stuff that they talk about. There's a System 2, which is like this rational processing um, sort of linguistic uh, reasoning part of the brain that's very slow and deliberate. And then you have the System 1, which I think Lacan would probably call the imagination, which is this instantaneous, non-rational grasping of ideas as a whole and you, you everyone's had like an, a eureka moment where they understand something all at once it's not like you reason this therefore this therefore this it's it just sort of bubbles up from somewhere in your consciousness all at once and then you just get it and then you can express it using reason and logic so al-ghazali sort of talks about these things a fair amount um and so does seraphim rose although he's much more radical and he focuses much more on sort of high topics of religion and uh, politics more nigel soden uh two countries go to war against each other praying to the same god getting the inspiration from the same book poor god go this is the fallen nature of man i'm afraid you can burn all the bibles in the world and you'll still have men slaughtering each other for differences of belief i mean you know they're communists who went to war with each other they're you know you're you're not going to reach this is the problem is you're imagining you're going to get to a world beyond politics beyond belief and w even within religions politics doesn't end you're and so creating this world in which you uh, you adopt this kind of secular humanism that dreams of progress towards a liberated society it actually kind of condemns you to conflict because it requires you oppressing everyone but never mind that. I mean, even the most perfect utopia, there's divisions of interest and society will fra fracture and they will adopt, uh, they will hew to belief systems that most represent their interests for the most part. Some people hew to what they think is absolutely true. And yeah, you, 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 you're going to always have conflict. And so you just try and believe what's true and you move forward from there, whatever your, whatever your belief system happens to be. I, I, I think that you have to go with the truth, however the fuck you get there. I mean, you know, you, you don't know. Hopefully you get given some kind of revelatory experience or, 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 or for the rest of us, we hobble along with what we've inherited. Um, and I think that's pretty, pretty decent. Um, the closing of the American mind school of darkness in the red decade. Ooh, that's, those are some good, those are some good recommendations. Um, uh, so for anyone who hasn't, um, hasn't read these, uh, the school of darkness is Bella Visono Dodd. 
uh, who was a school teacher and Roman Catholic uh, who became part of the Communist Party in America and infiltrated the Catholic Church. Um, the closing of the American mind is, oh, good God, it's not Mark Lilla, it's, it's Mark Lilla. I forget now. I haven't read it, but I know about it. It's a very big book and it's sitting on a list somewhere and pirated on my hard drive. I possibly, who knows? Um, then the red decade, the red De decade is by a journalist in the 1930s called Eugene Leon. And it's, it, he, he covers how, uh, he covers a lot of, um, infiltration of, uh, of, of American institutions by Soviet agents. Uh, illiberal reformers. I'm not sure about that. I don't think I've seen uh, read that one. Uh, Rothbard's The Progressive Era. Yeah, that's 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 a very important one. That's a it's an analysis of much of the early 20th century and the, the economics and politics of that era. Um, traditional society. So when I was talking about traditional society, I just mean society before uh, the modern revolutionary ideas. Uh, came in it's not really all that complicated but if you want to get really sort of um, technical about it revolution traditional society and modern society uh, are opposed to each other in a specific sense so uh, a traditional society has this idea of an eternal truth right and that eternal truth is something that structures rituals and traditions um, and is passed on because it's true um, a modern society comes from the word mode, or uh, which in most European languages means fashion or trend, right? So the idea is that there's uh, there's a new there's some new event that arises that gives you a new goal. That so progress and revolution become these sort of different modes of viewing. How, how modern society structures its morality and its idea of what goes into the future and its idea of history and continuity. Its idea of continuity is change. So modernity, modernity is structured in that way, constant innovation, constant reformation, constant restructuring and shaking up, move fast and break things. Uh, Slavoj Žižek has proved to be a perverted, degenerate Marxist and a plagiarist. A plagiarist? I haven't heard about that. Um... Steve Saylor identifies Zizek's plagiarism in a book written by the fraudster in 2006. A plea for a return to difference with minor pro domasur stole the work of Kevin MacDonald, Professor Emeritus of Psychology, out of a review of MacDonald's book by Stanley Hornbeck that appeared in March. Hmm. Direct plagiarism? I'll have to look that up. If it's direct plagiarism, I'll be shocked. But um, here we go. Uh, listening to this makes me wonder which brand of weed these people smoke. The cleverer they think they are, the nuttier they are. Well, yeah, pretty much everyone who goes to university smokes cannabis, I'm afraid. That's that's kind of par for the course. Um, uh, bed is cheap. Yeah, club group. You hip to recht. It is, uh, it is true. Interesting to come up with a theory, but these days, uh, these theories into practice and kill millions of people one day. They say, oops, we need to revisit this theory and try again. Dude, it's actually true. You know what Zizek says? He says um, you should take a leaf out of, what's that playwright's name? Uh, the the waiting for uh, Goddard guy. Um, uh, Bertolt, is it Bertolt Brecht? God, I don't know my modernist theater at all. But so he says, you know, try again, fail again, fail better. And that's actually a horrifying, it's it's absolutely horrifying. He's fully aware of this. He says, ah, just, just keep trying, just keep killing people until you get there. Um, it's, it's a goddamn nightmare. Uh, people don't even talk about science as a process. They talk about a consensus of scientists. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. That is, that is correct. That's uh, scientism, you know. Uh, cause the left need to ensure that all the science of whatever's really relevant for the narrative, pretty much. Um, it suits their tactic of pushing non-conforming intellectuals and researchers out of universities. It's literally a prestige game. Yeah, but it's, it, 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 think of it like a religion. I mean, the, the, 
the university is part of this cathedral like structure so three percent are trolls yeah it, it it's that's the kind of thing that's the lizard man con uh, co co um, constant um <laughs> so prince of Pont, because it was rigged i personally believe that there was pretty clear and uh, damning evidence of shenanigans that went on in that election and i have this little yardstick if you wouldn't believe an African president after using such tactics, then don't believe a white man if he uses such tactics. It's a simple one plus one. Hmm? Ah. A true Christian is an atheist. Reminds me of the utopian, uh, Unitarian Utopian Socialists of the 1800s like Wentworth Higgins who went on the farm. Yeah. So um, a lot of the Fabians had a similar thing. And there was the, the early communist society, the League of Communists. A lot of them were sort of these strange, I don't, strange kind of twisted Christians where, they, where they, they, they sort of, they advertised a Christian virtue on the outside, but only realized in terms of material ends, which it's, 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 it's a very peculiar thing. And they, Twist this idea of uh, oh, they twist the idea of Christ quite comprehensively. So Agrippa says to offer credit where it's due, to check on the improvement of interracial relations, we should be ruthlessly critical about our past and especially the past which continues in our present. We should not succumb to self contempt. Respect uh, uh, respect for others based on self contempt is always and by definition false. The paradox is that in our societies, the white people who participate in anti-racist protests are mostly the upper middle class white people who hypocritically enjoy their guilt. True, Robert, we are all guilty of hypocrisy. Some too great. And shame. Ah, that's two different points. So Zizek is right about this, but his solution is just say, well, drop that, that they must drop that sort of gap um, and just completely commit. You know, they must, they must completely surrender to the revolution. But it's difficult to do so because if you look at how he has to behave rhetorically, he has to constantly slip between different positions, like between identity pandering and between sort of irreverent um, rhetoric in order to kind of constantly shapeshift it to keep this middle ground where he's aiming for, for the universal. Um so he's not doing very well. It's, it, 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 he's very good at it, but it ends up with people not knowing what he's doing. And what he's simply doing is he's aiming for this non-racial, universalist, complete dissolution of all cultural identities and structures and autonomies in service of a universal state. Bureaucratic managed. Uh, basically, he would be. I imagine he'd be pushing for the Great Reset, but then, you know, kicked big tech to the curb that would be his ideal government gentle inflatables hello ashley hello agrippa says with increasing wisdom epicureanism becomes more attractive than the grim philosophy of the stoics don't sacrifice yourself for too many and too for too many causes okay did i really miss the whole reading again yes d you you did I, look, I'm sorry. I don't announce these things because I don't want to have too many people in the stream. Because if I have too many people in the stream, then what happens is I can't actually answer questions. Um, so it doesn't really work out. And if I feel like reading something else, I've got no time left at the end of it. You know. Man is born with inherent rights bestowed by the divine or natural world. The organized state of mankind can defend those inherent rights or expropriate them. Therefore, the political spectrum ranges from anarchy, democracy, to absolute authoritarianism. A genuine republic is the ideal for a balanced power. It's an interesting perspective. I have a lot of sympathy with that perspective, actually. Um, I think particularly if you have... Um, particularly if you have a pluralist society, you might have a problem with that. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, like an ethno-pluralism, not like... I mean, actually, religious pluralism is also problematic from that point because you're going to have to sit and do power brokering over and over again. And this this difference will always create, um, you know, it'll always create some degree of diffidence, distrust, you know. 
So over time, you eventually get ethnic conflicts. These things don't hold. Uh, the empires that last for a really long time tend to be ones that are either homogenous or they are they don't allow input from you know any but the one predominant ethnicity and so you can have several you can have several hundred years of ethnic domination um or you can have several hundred years of a homogeneity but managing ethnic differences is always going to be difficult. And you always either need something that's going to bind everyone together or it's just constant politics, you know. And politics can lead to war. Oh, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. And I think the thing is to realize that, po that conflict is inevitable, whether within a society or between societies. And so, um, yes, I do tend towards, you know, a, a genuine republic. Um, Harold Bloom. Harold Bloom. What do the fuck is John Lilla? The fuck is going wrong with my brain? Harold Bloom. Harold Bloom. Oh, I read a fucking cool article by him. By him, by the way, like a couple of years ago, he was talking about when he was in China, and he he was talking about how in China most of the most of the Western philosophers, particularly the modern ideas that the West are using, are just completely seen as rubbish by Chinese philosophers. They're interest, They're not even interested in learning English. They'd rather you learn Latin. Um, Alan Bloom. There we go. So they'd rather learn Latin in order to go back to the um, to reading the, the classics than learning English to read anyone else. Um, and so. The, uh, the the big philosophers there at the moment are some are like are actually they, they said the big ones are Strauss and Schmidt. Those are the Western philosophers that the Chinese think are important, Strauss and Schmidt, and then you'll get like a bit of like Huntington and Fukuyama. And so Bloom was making an interesting point there about like ah we don't care about English English is a useless language we want, we'd rather read the classics, and I thought that was a really interesting remark. Um, uh, ba, 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 I think Eastern Orthodox is about the most balanced. Yeah, um, I'd say so. But it's it, you've got to realize that it is kind of scary because you have to devote yourself to this like deep well of mysticism, where generations upon generations of men have reflected slowly and cautiously upon the, the Gospels and upon the Old Testament, and. There's this long community of slow meditative consideration of the spiritual process of theosis based on this interaction between the holy book and the community. And, and, and it's a lot of people um, look at it now and this, 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 the, 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 it's, it doesn't respond to the modern world. It sees the modern world as some kind of intrusion, some interference. Orthodoxy is about returning to something that's eternal. It's a true tradition. It's not like Protestants who continually try and reform the church to match what's outside them, and you know you lose you lose continuity, you lose substance, you lose veracity. When you make a religion modern, then you fall you, you fall prey to the same sicknesses that sicknesses that modernity has. It's not the tradition can't adapt itself to technological changes. I think that I, I really think that that's a very different proposition from uh, from the social changes. Uh, learning to deal with different technology is not the same as abandoning tradition, and I think uh, I think we know this. But uh, yeah, would you be up to giving some comments on Russia and how she fits in the geopolitical game of current events? Boy, I haven't looked at Russia for a long time. Russia's been hedging their bets. A lot of that pipeline that's going between Germany and Russia, that's a good move. Um, it keeps it keeps the, the, way, the Europeans from moving too hard against Russia, which I think is smart. I don't encourage people to be hostile to Russia. Russia is a country that understands it will not fuck with you if you do not fuck with it, and you, you, you keep a distance and you don't fuck around on its border. 
So what happened in Azerbaijan and Armenia, they sold weapons to both sides, made a bit of money. And then when things looked like it was getting too hairy and it might be the Turks taking over Armenia, they say, okay, that's enough playing around. It's over. We signed the deal. So they broke a deal. So you get these kind of perspectives. The Russians see themselves as having to maintain this enormous buffer zone. And they see the world in terms of empires, and they see the world not in terms of ideology so much. They think that ideology is sort of people getting lost in bullshit or as lies told by people in power, which is understandable. But Russia is also a small country, economically speaking, and they need to protect themselves um, because they can easily be overrun. Real trouble comes when Putin's done. Who's going to replace him? That's really, I, I hope that he finds some reasonable replacement because Russia's not going to survive with democracy. A liberal democracy would tear Russia apart in a generation. They'd be, they'd be over. Um, uh, I, I think that Russia is used as a bogeyman for, for a very specific reason. The reason that the, the Americans lean on is they're the only country that the, the liberal transatlantic elite do not have an economic stake in. So they're the only country that, ex that they can afford to insult and libel. And so all of the stuff about the, 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 the electoral conspiracy of collusion back in 2016, I mean... It's very transparent that what they're doing is who can they pin it on? I mean, in reality, there are plenty of culprits. If you're not a politician, you could go, ooh, you know, hypothetically, let's say someone did get involved in interfering in the election. Ooh, it could be China, it could be Israel, it could be Saudi Arabia, it could be, could even be somewhere in Western Europe, it could be, could be any, could be anything. However, they had to go for Russia because they can't accuse all of these people. These people donate to them. They rely on them for supply chains and investment. Hair scissors are ironic. What, 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 what are hair scissors ironic for? I use it to trim my bed so that I don't have fuzz going around. Um, <laughs> but that's it. Um, I don't have anything really profound for you anymore. Um, if you've got any more questions and you'd like to poke me about them, then go ahead. However, I am done with this little lecture. I think what I'm going to do maybe next time is do instead. Oh, here we go. Do you foresee a rapprochement between Europe and Russia? Number one clipper. Yeah, no, the, the guard on my clipper is gone. So I just use this. Uh, so I just use this guy for, you know, just edging um but uh do you foresee a rapprochement between europe and russia you know um it's already going on to some extent they're sort of easing off a little bit um and i think part of that is uh part of that is germany's uh pipeline i think germany who've been cutting a lot of their nuclear energy in the past several years um, they've become more reliant on fossil fuels. And even if you're going to do wind or solar or whatever, it's still not quite at that point where you can entirely survive on wind or solar. So you have to, you have to sort of backstop with gas and all of the heating in Europe is still done with gas. I mean, that, that little bastard behind me there, I mean, it's wonderfully hot, but it's old fashioned. It's gas. And so everything that, uh, yeah, um, is Russia in the European Union a possibility? I, that in my, in my view, that would be, that would be the only way that I, the only new country that I would ever push for to join the European Union because it would immediately destroy it. Um, <laughs> I think the European Union is an awful idea. Um, and I think the nations are better off on their own. And, there's so much destruction that have been that's been wrought by the European Union, the European Central Bank, basically forcing, destroying everyone's wealth and printing money, and you know making everyone dependent on the the this this weird like 
debt spiral that everyone gets into to pay for um, um, uh, welfare. So the countries, uh, the countries, parties within countries will compete to see who can offer the most welfare to the to the population, and then they denominate their debt in euros, and then the debt is uh, it, it, the debt is mostly in bonds, and then of course the European Central Bank insures the bonds, and then they print money in or they print money in order to ease the the pressure on these um, this bond debt. The Lebensraum, so long, you for money, I would be. Uh, yeah, so the, the, I don't think that's any good. I think German Germany is a cursed country. They, there's a reason their main export is angst and scat porn. I think that, I mean, aside from cars, um, although that's that's going to go soon. I mean, like Germany. Germany is a doomed country. It's a tragic country. They, they, they're doomed to sort of be, be have their have their power checked over and over again and be scattered over and over again. Would you give your testimony some time? What, what, what do you mean? I'll give you time. I'll give you some time to give to clarify that one because I don't know what that means. Bum, bum, bum. Come on, Gareth. Tell me what you mean. <laughs> now, the ECB has kept those lending rates negative for several years now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is this is like uh, slow motion Mugabe nomics. You know, it's. it's what, what are we doing here? You know? You're a Christian. How did you come to that and why did you choose to believe? I look, I'm very tentative. I believe it's the truth. I process. I, I came to sort of by a negative path in a way because what I, I I was a rather firmly believing progressive universal humanist, you know, like um, atheist materialist, the whole thing, you know, believe in communism and so on. Uh, when did the stream start? The stream started literally exactly two hours ago. Um, Terribly sorry, old chap, but you missed the meat. Um, I think that the question about Christianity is actually a fair one, and I think it'll be the last question I take, and then I'll log off. But I think it's I think it's it's pertinent. So what I was looking at is I was in the middle of the fallist movement, which is the which is Rhodes Must Fall. It started out as Rhodes Must Fall, and Rhodes Must Fall was first just a hashtag that we used to organize people around pressure to take down the statue of Cecil John Rhodes at UCT. And, you know, it's an, he's an offensive colonialist. How dare we? This is basically like the university wearing a swastika on its arm. So we looked at it this way. And as young students, we, we all were looking. We all felt that we were looking for something, some kind of revolutionary event that would sweep us up and transform everything because we've been led to believe it just by the background sort of noise of, of progressive society. And when this came, it attracted people like moths to the flame with all kinds of grievances they just pulled out of their ass. Some of them true um, and valid grievances and a lot of them just simmering resentment and nonsense. And so the thing is that there were several traits of this this movement which made it sort of something that's um, that was the perfect embodiment of this like transcendental, like structureless uh, revolution. So you see, the way that I saw it was, you have um, like if you like the, the the Trotskyist myth of the of the of the of the the Russian Revolution was, you have this pure democratic revolution that was spontaneous. It came from the people, the spontaneous outburst of their heart against tyranny. And what happened is it was taken over by some outside agents and and what have you. And I mean, look, there's there's a sense in which this is true. But the reality is that when you have a revolution. It cannot exist without an elite that give it an idea, that give it a direction. 
Okay. It cannot exist without that. And so, and in order to consolidate the power will always require violence. That's how revolutions work. Now, I didn't believe this. I thought that there was this mythic event that will come where you have a true revolution that will one day come that will not be betrayed, will not be captured by uh, re reactionary elements, you know, won't have won't be the terror like the French Revolution because that, that'll be a betrayal of the true democratic sort of so you look to like these anarchist principles a little bit in a way so the interesting thing is one of the earliest people who joined um who joined the fallist movement was a was a group of sort of like larping rich kids called the anarchist collective and I was friends with a few of them and I remember I went down to, uh, I offered to actually help them with their little talks because none of them had ever read uh, an anarchist text before. That should give you the picture of what they were like. And I, so one day after the roads was full, I was feeling fairly ill and I was hanging out in the cafeteria. And then I said, look up and I noticed uh, Todd and some of the other people coming up and they were chaining themselves to lampposts and shit, and they had tape on their mouths. And, um, <laughs> worship of Joe Pesci. I've always liked that joke. I mean, George Carlin can be cheesy and boring sometimes, but I really like that Joe Pesci joke. I thought that was great. Anyway, so I, just, I, I asked him, wait, what are you doing? This is weird. Um, and, and he just kind of gave me this look like you wouldn't understand. But he, like he didn't say anything. He just kind of looked at me and then looked away, chaining himself in this like stoic pose. And I thought it was a load of wank. And so, um, but these people, uh, even though they weren't all that important, they ended up having quite a shaping effect on the early days of uh, early days of the fallist revolution because. Uh, everywhere else, when fees must fall arrived, it was the student representative councils that led everything. So these are like, uh, if you're not South African, a student representative councils are actually protected in the constitution. Every student body is entitled to have um, um, essentially its own parliament and its own representatives. And what they did, is, what they're usually composed of is sort of junior versions of the national parties. So Sasco is the ANC, and then you've got the DA and the EFF and all the others, right? And the the one thing that that that, that struck me was well, even primary and secondary schools have a right to this. It's true, and if they ex choose to exercise those rights, you know, we have hell to pay because then you have revolutionary councils directing the school around. Um, but that's coming soon. We're already starting to see it in the private schools with um, as fallism is trickling down. I mean, the, the, these people put out their tentacles and got active in, in, in high school communities as well. Um, there's some extraordinary stuff, extraordinarily pricey things. Like they would take go and take like high school students and take them out to French Hook and take them to like these incredibly expensive things. It was So these are like fairly well-off black elites and their kids at university who are taking like um, high school kids from poor communities and saying like, like so that you're comparing whites uh, at a level that far above even the black elites, you're the richest of the rich white to like these black elites and then the poor blacks. And you're saying, see, this is how white people live. And then you'll do like your revolutionary training at these highly expensive events in places like French Hook. So it's, it's extraordinarily interesting. Um, the kind of tactics they use for radicalization. But back to my point, it's 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 that this this outburst, this little cultural revolution that started on our campus, rejected the SRC because we don't have leaders. We are a leaderless, flat organization. We're spontaneous. We are the spontaneous outburst of the people's will, the will of the people. And it is in this moment that you actually, for me, I looked at it and I said, yeah, okay, that formula says that this is the true revolution. It has to be. Because everything about it, even though I disagree with with a lot of things that they're saying, I was like, well, this must be this must be true because the formula is correct. This is the will of the people. This is what spontaneous direct democracy looks like. 
And then Biko was introduced and everyone agreed that white people had to be segregated from the movement. And I was like, hey, hang on a second. There's something wrong. That's morally wrong. You can't segregation, racial discrimination are morally wrong. This was my position. And I sort of addressed my friends and I said, well, I assume that they would, they would react, you know, uh, earnestly and they didn't instead they 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 lashed out at me extraordinarily and i was completely ostracized and i was treated immediately from that moment as someone who still identified as a communist i was called an i was called a member of the alt right the term that has no meaning it's 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 um People already self-worship. Yeah, I mean, if you notice the, the gist of this thing, it's really talking about self-ism, as uh, Peter Hitchens calls it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a deity created. Oh, goodness me, that's true. So, um, yeah, you, you, I assume you've bumped into Nick Land a couple of times. I've got an essay on Nick Land, actually. Um, I'd love to do it. Um, but it's, it's like the... The, the, the thing that I'm getting here is I, I saw in this movement, this is the culmination of everything I believe. All of the progressive ideals about bringing together the, the, the peoples of the South African nation and giving them space and pride in, in, in their community and in their institutions to deliver a new future that is egalitarian and democratic in nature. That's what I believed in. And it's what I saw forming in front of me. And what really changed was when I noticed how rapidly this, this transformed. It didn't just turn a little bit, because I was worried that maybe years down the line we'd see some fascism emerging. It took like a few weeks, and the whole thing became openly genocidal. It was hectically totalitarian. There was no disagreement. Everything had the suffocating, absolutely poisonous atmosphere. And you're watching people left, right, and center going through enormous um, uh, sort of psychological traumas and, and, and crises of identity. And every other white kid was like shaving their head in some kind of penance and self dissolution and self. It was really bizarre. Um, I, I I looked at this whole movement and it was it horrified me because we're getting to the point where um, I, I mean I didn't know what to do it was it was like it was like I'd been sort of walking off the cliff you know like like uh, like Wiley Coyote it was like I was walking off the cliff sort of casually and then one day I look down and I start falling that was that was what I was looking at and so I spent ages all of the years since 2015 i've been spending sort of like diligently looking at what um why 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 do they believe this I, I, this is why i did my honors dissertation uh on on terrorist radicalization and uh you know i wanted to understand radicalization how did people come to embrace radical ideologies and a friend of mine was doing the same thing from a, the, the anthropology department. And so he got long form interviews with all of the major figures in the movement. So I got to have, and he was living with me. So I got to have this sort of like very, very good insight into the backgrounds and the lives of a lot of the different prominent characters in the movement, why they believe what they believe, which texts they encountered, which uh, thinkers really highlighted um, these ideas for them. Um, and so by looking at all of this, I got a very sort of broad spectrum uh, overview of this kind of stuff. But what really sort of stood out to me was that um, all of these ideas shared certain thinkers in common and certain ideas in common. And I started noticing this in, in, in like the woke stuff that was coming that, that had been infiltrating us from the West that I first, you know, you, you sort of don't really absorb critically. Um, it's just sort of part of the background noise of university for a while. But I really started critically interrogating this stuff and I got deep into it for a long time. A lot of this, uh, there's a word for it in, 
it, it, there's a word for it in in in, uh, in in Christian theology. They call it a history of error. When you write a book about all of the idea uh, ideas and influences that 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 cause this heresy to emerge, you, you write this book. It's called a history of error. And so I sort of a lot of what I've been doing in in forms of in terms of any form of research so far has been sort of like a history of error. How did we get to this point where ordinary people who enjoyed their time with each other across racial boundaries and believed in all kinds of happy things decided to that the other that the other group deserved to die you know i wanted to know how that had happened and uh, i ended up uh, looking immersing myself into a whole bunch of stuff like uh, you know um and now i've gone back to the point where i'm saying well the whole west left the, the whole left tradition, in fact, the whole enlightenment tradition for me is something that is, it's morally poisoned, you know, it's morally poisoned. And it's not like you can't get good things out of it. There are plenty of observations, there are plenty of things, but really, for the most part, it needs to actually be jettisoned and to sort of left to wither. And the thing is, with all of those ideas is you can... You can never kill them forever. They will return. And so I think I think we're past the point of innocence. We can't innocently believe in Christian dogma anymore. We have to believe it as people who, who've seen the temptations of the other side. And I think I think that's very much what the Enlightenment um, has been is it's an introduction of ideas, some of which are good, some of which are bad. Obviously, they're not all bad ideas, but they're always introduced at the perfect time to cause the maximum damage to society. Um, always harmful, always um, cynical. Um, and it's really poisonous. I mean, like... Uh, always got this anti-christian bent to it all of the things that make christianity what it is we have embedded morality in our society that is a, that is perfectly inverted of every single thing that makes christianity what it is and um it's clearly not making us a healthy people it clearly isn't. And, and this whole thing that Zizek has been talking about, where he talks about this transnational agency that takes away politics from you, so that you exist as a community that exists without boundaries, without any permanent institutions, just a transnational agency. So, and by agency, I don't mean an agency like the FBI. I mean just agency, sort of like a diffuse sense of agency. And this sort of Almost, it, 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 he seems to be playing with that sort of liminal realm between anarchism com and communism. We know that where anarchism has been practiced, it has required a sort of extremely tyrannical um, exercise of rule by a tiny central um, elite that usually refuses to call itself an official elite. Um, and I mean, Seraphim Rose points out that communism and anarchism are the same. You know, no state, no property, no gods, no masters. It's all the same thing. Um, and it's just the the reality is wild chaos ridden upon by ruthless, aim, uh, ruthless, amoral tyrants whose whose membership re gets recycled at a rapid pace. And uh, I, I think you, you you really see his he his his philosophy very nearly supports the Great Reset. And then there's something he wrote actually recently. Um, and he he I think he I think he feels a bit of doubt. I think he feels a little bit of loss of direction now because there's an there's an interview in what's this magazine called? It's in Haaretz. It's from a few months ago, um, and so he talks about like ecological disasters and and and, and technological surveillance terminating democracy and so on. And, uh, he talks about reorganizing society at a global level. 
this is very much great reset stuff, but then there's that part of him which always sort of holds back and, th and thinks, oh, shit, I don't really believe in this ugly shite. Um, but he never comes to that breaking point where he says no. You know, he never reaches that breaking point where he says, actually, no, this is far enough. He's stuck in that moment where I was listening to Steve Biko and going, hang on, guys, there's something a little bit off. Like, I can get the, the whole sort of, like, being proud of black thing, but, you know, maybe... Mm. So he's stuck in that little moment. And when he looks at, like, the, the, the surveillance state and the intrusion of big tech, when he looks at transhumanist ideas, when he looks at um, transgenderism, in each of these moments, he feels that unease where he can tell that there's something nasty being done, something mutilating being done to the human spirit in the name of the very thing that he has been seduced to propagate as a global religion. But he never, ever surrenders that cult. He just sort of hangs back and flinches in doubt. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think that I think that this is a this is a difficult this is a difficult situation. Yeah. Poor Zizek. Well, I don't have so much. I, I, I don't. Regret, I, I think he's doing fine. He's he's a very beautiful wife, young kids, um, prestigious university position, desired all over the world. I can't pity him too much. He seems to be doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> Why is Christianity such a threat? Well, it's simple. It, the power power relies on morality. It, it relies on instructions and norms, right? It relies on a, a predictable environment where people cooperate, right? So Christianity has its own structure, and this modern thing, which was born out of an opposition to the Christian church uh, during the Renaissance uh, in secret societies and occult societies and humanist um the humanist societies, and coalesced in the French Revolution. This whole thing is against traditional society. It's against traditional Christianity. And so all the critiques that are bound up in it, that structures that structures this sort of grand material Gnostic ec ecumenism. And so... What what you end up getting is um, is a situation where Christianity, the foundations of Christianity, promotes behavior and so social structures and norms which are threatening to the stability of this hierarchy, because all of the means by which it justifies itself, things like human rights and so on, they don't really apply in a Christian world. In a Christian world, you have to restrain your sexuality. Sexuality is something that is, by law, has to be liberated, according to, 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 to Gnostic materialism. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the Jesuit Pope is, he's, I don't believe he's really a Christian. I don't really believe he's a Christian. Not at all. Yeah. Um. The Jesuits. Well, I mean, you, you. By the way, do you know? Do you know what uh, what what the Jesuits are famous for? They're famous for something called casuistry. And now it's used. It's it tends to be used as like a, an epithet in in in, in, uh, in philosophy because it's often used instrumentally to doubt things that are that to undermine doctrines which seem inconvenient. And what it is is it sort of says that each law must only be applied in its appropriate context. How can you possibly argue with that? It's eminently reasonable, except the way it's interpreted is often to mean that... Um, was there, there's, there's a famous joke that I think everyone in the Catholic world has heard where you, um, you, have, two, um, you have two novices entering... Um, entering a, a, a seminary, and one is a one's a Franciscan, and one's a Jesuit. Isn't that weird that the Jesuit would name himself Francis? Anyway, makes you makes you think that he's a Franciscan, and then he's actually a Jesuit. Anyway, um, 
but the, the Franciscan and the Jesuit are going to the church and they, they talk to the father and, and, and they both smoke, right? And so they desperately want a smoke break, but the, the, the prayer cycle goes on for quite long because they've been trained in priesthood. And, you know, they, and so like in the break after Vespers, they go to the, um, they go to the, they go to the priest and they say, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the Franciscan goes to the priest and he said, look, would it be possible to smoke while we pray? The priest says, no, no, of course not. Uh, that's, that's not the done thing. You, you, pr you pray. And so the, uh, he comes back and he says to the Jesuit, ah, oh, it's no good. It's no good. He won't let us. The Jesuit says, no, it's easy. He goes up to the priest and he asks the priest, Father, would it be acceptable if we prayed while we smoked? <laughs> and so just, just with that little sort of like inversion, you undermine the whole basis of the purpose of the very thing that you're there to do. <laughs> Instead of prayer being about reflection, it becomes about sort of a relaxing self-indulgence. And th that would be Jesuitism for you. So, and and the Jesuits are the ones who pushed uh, during the Second Vatican Council for uh, Freemasons to be accepted again, which they now are. So, and Freemasons being, of course, a, a, a Gnostic cult, um, at least in my opinion. I'm sure many will disagree with that, but. They do have a sort of Gnostic approach to most things. On that note, I'm going to end the broadcast. Thank you all for tuning in.